Just as the dark impenetrable night will eventually give way to the piercing light of the sun, a new Resident Evil title will always mean a new entry in the RE retrospective and today is an especially exciting affair. Much like most of Capcom's Resident Evil output lately, I have maintained radio silence for this one. I have followed zero pre-release news and stayed away from any speculation or leaks, so this is going to be a fresh, straight from the dome sort of situation. And with that being said, why don't we stop wasting time and jump right into this thing. What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews, welcome to the Resident Evil Retrospective. Hole. Sorry about that. So here's a little personal history before we start this. When the RE2 remake was being produced, I essentially disconnected from the internet. I stayed away from news, speculation, leaks, everything. And when the game finally hit shelves, I found going in blind was one of the most satisfying experiences I've had with the game in a very long time. So every subsequent release in the series, I've taken the same actions in hope of letting the game surprise me. And what all that adds up to is, as I write this, I know next to nothing about Resident Evil 8 other than the fact that Ethan Winters is once again the protagonist of a numbered RE game, and insert the relevant Lady Dimitrescu meme here. Of course, I do have my own expectations, and most of what I've seen has led me to believe that this game's staff couldn't be further up RE4 fans' asses if they tried. Which isn't some kind of a jab, by the way. Listen, I get it. Me and my kind, aka people who prefer the survival horror entries in the early series, just aren't the target audience anymore. If the roles were reversed, trust me, I'd be thrilled to be pandered to. So I'm taking a very lax approach to this new entry. Those of you who've been around for a while have probably picked up on this by now, but I have my own beliefs on how a Resident Evil title should play out, but regardless of that bias, I'm going into this game with the goal of enjoying it no matter what generation of the fandom is the target demographic. Of course, I will be noting similarities and differences between this, the classics, and more modern RE games, but I'm not going to let bias blind me to a fun experience. I guess now that I'm thinking about it, this little opening was more of a pep talk for me than you guys, but at least now some of you may have a better idea of where I'm coming from. And that being the case, why don't we take a hard look at a story written by someone with a very clear fetish for hand mutilation. Resident Evil 8 starts off with a surprisingly off-brand papercraft sequence telling the story of a little girl venturing into the forest. Now I'm fully aware it hasn't even been a full minute since I promised not to come down too hard on this game, but I just don't understand why Capcom thought this belonged at the start of an RE game. It feels more like the beginning of one of those puzzle platformers like Limbo, and in my opinion doesn't exactly put you in the mood for what's to come. So she drank the thick, dark blood and smiled with joy. Once that odd inclusion is finished, we find our happy couple from the last game relaxing and spending some time with their newborn daughter. A daughter I would love to make fun of for having a big head if I didn't have a pretty big head myself when I was a kid. And if you're wondering what the hell I'm talking about, Capcom was nice enough to include a little recap summing up the events of the seventh game. The long and short of that being, after Ethan was reunited with Mia at the end of the last game, Chris shipped them off to some remote part of Europe where they could live together without the world's foremost medical researchers putting them on the operating table every time they want to know a little bit more about Evelyn's mold powers. The game starts off with what seems like a pretty calm little evening, but there seems to be something bothering Mia. Before we get a chance to see some first-person marital argument action, Mia gets plugged from all sides with a trench coat bedecked Chris Redfield putting a few rounds through her brain just for good measure. Sorry, Ethan. No! Ethan, being understandably a little peeved by the cold-blooded murder of his wife, pleads with Chris as he takes their baby away. Ethan gets thrown in the back of a van and that's our start. We know exactly nothing of what led Chris to betray the couple he went through so much to help and what Ethan's daughter Rose has to do with all this. After this pretty damn intriguing beginning, Ethan wakes up at the side of his wrecked transport. He's cold, alone, and apparently he's been dropped off in a town filled to the brim with werewolves of some kind. And I think I speak for all of us when I say werewolves in an RE game is totally on brand and not absolutely fucking ridiculous. Moving on, after we run into some of the surviving locals, we find out just about what could be assumed given the situation. 
They were a small village that was suddenly beset by these creatures and now next to no one's left alive. And the scant few that remain alive aren't after this scene. After a bit of old RV exploration, we come across this guy, Heisenberg, who's more than happy to increase Ethan's daily iron intake. Damn it, that's funny. And we're put in front of what is essentially the game's Legion of Doom, a group of oddballs and mutated freaks all taking orders from this woman in the middle, Mother Miranda. The big boss decides our fate should be in the hands of low-rent Magneto over here, and after escaping his death trap, the game opens up proper. The rest of the runtime is spent trying to reunite Ethan with his daughter and discovering little tidbits about the major players, and once again we get a very segmented story. In the last numbered entry, the story was basically get off the baker's property, preferably with your wife in tow, but towards the end it turns into something that more fits into the overall RE canon, and I was surprised to see the same exact approach used here. I won't ruin anything specific yet, but clearly Capcom has found a system they like because the parallels between 7 and 8 in terms of overall structure, delivery, and imagery are too strong to ignore, and to be totally honest, I kind of like it. Essentially, the formula is to give the player a hard goal to aim for and keep the story delivered in service of that goal very localized. No outside elements mentioned and no indication that anything other than this event is taking place in the wider world. And then in the last quarter of the game, dump a bunch of story on the player that ties everything they just experienced to some kind of previously established plot elements. I really like this approach in 7 because while I did think it was refreshing to experience the story of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in first person, it was nice being reminded I was playing an RE game for the last portion of the runtime. In that same vein, it's nice having a simple motivation with no outside elements cluttering it up, but at the end of the day, people don't put 60 bucks down on a new RE game because they want to forget the rest of the franchise. So I guess let's approach this a little differently than usual. First I'll talk about that self-contained first third of the game and then we'll go into spoiler territory. The first thing I noticed right off the bat was another returning element from 7 and that's a focus on character over story. It seemed clear to me pretty early on that Capcom had come up with a few interesting bad guys and sort of worked their way out from that starting point. Something I can't exactly criticize since they really did go all out making some memorable antagonists. That being said, after the credits rolled, it was a little hard to deny that they essentially cloned their same exact approach to story from the last game. You know, the whole multiple bad guys sharing a small portion of the gameplay and story development with their own sectioned off gameplay areas thing. But hey, I guess it worked last time and really it's not a problem here per se, but I am a little apprehensive thinking of them following these same exact blueprints for the next one. Individually, it felt like Lady Dimitrescu and Heisenberg got the most time and resources devoted to their stories and gameplay sections, which is fitting for me since I found both of them to be the most interesting right off the bat. Despite the fact that I actively stayed away from any info regarding the game, it was hard to even casually browse the internet without seeing the entire population of the Earth collectively popping boners over Lady Dimitrescu, rightfully so by the way, and that did lead me to believe that she would be the main antagonist, but after her section of the game was over, I was actually kind of excited to see what they would do with the other guys. Sadly, I did not get the deep character development I would have wanted, but an approach like that would have likely felt out of place in the snappy pace of this story. So here's where things get a little complicated. I'm about to criticize something I've already admitted to enjoying, but do me a favor and hear me out. Like I said before, I do like how they structured the story of RE7, and in theory that means I'm just as happy with that same process showing up almost beat for beat here in 8, but it feels incredibly lazy to me at the same time. Sure, I got a kick out of how 7 was laid out, and no, not every entry in the series should be reinventing the wheel in terms of narrative delivery, but I want to at least see that some kind of effort is being made during development. It's sort of like finding out one of your favorite pieces of artwork was traced. That may still be a very incredible looking piece of art, but realistically you're probably going to appreciate the original much more. Stay the fuck down! Even while I was enjoying the story of 8, I kept getting hit with this cheap feeling. Kind of like, yeah, I'm having fun, but just off in the distance I can barely make out several decisions being made not because they would make for the best story, but because they had already been vat grown in a lab and scientifically proven to test well within my target demographic. You know what I mean? I guess what I'm trying to say here is that this feels less like a story that was organically written by someone who wanted to tell an awesome tale, but instead feels like something cloned from another property where it did really well. And yeah, that does mean I liked it almost as much as I did before, but it's hard not to see it as a little more cheap and less impactful this time around. 
So if there's one thing I hope for in the next entry in the series, it'd be for the writers to spend a little time developing a new formula. And now since we're moving on to the last section of the story, I'll warn you there will be massive spoilers ahead. So if you haven't finished 8 yet, click the link in the description, go to the timestamp on screen, or check the chapters in the timeline to avoid ruining what I think is actually a pretty cool little story. This game is mostly one big build up to a huge reveal, and trust me when I say it's far better to experience it on your own than having some dork on the internet like me read it to you. Hey, are you listening? Okay, so we might need a little recap to end this discussion. As far as we know, Ethan was sitting down to dinner with his wife one night until Chris Redfield drops on the house like a nuclear bomb, capping his girl, stealing his baby, and tying him up in the back of a van. Now, if you're anything like me, you saw Chris not actually being the bad guy in this situation from a mile away. Capcom is a lot of stuff nowadays, but prone to experimentation and risks is not one of them. So what is actually going down here? Well, Mother Miranda, the godlike matriarch of this village, has apparently been alive since World War II and has been known to have dealings with Oswald Spencer. In fact, the man himself credits her with the inspiration to start the Umbrella Corp, but more importantly, she lost her daughter a long time ago and sees Ethan and Mia's little moldy offspring as some kind of opportunity to get her back, since she apparently has some pretty impressive ability to control the mold stuff introduced in Seven. I actually enjoyed that they retroactively explained Evelyn as a failed attempt at bringing Mother Miranda's little girl back, but I just didn't like Mother Miranda herself as an antagonist. For 98% of the game, we're left with almost no information about her, and when we're finally let in on her history, it's literally the last 10 minutes of gameplay. Now, I'm not saying you can't bust out a surprise in the end for the player, but if that's the case, why tell us about her existence in the first place? Don't build this woman up as the main bad guy and then proceed to give her zero screen time for most of the game. If that was what they were going for, a much better approach would have been to have the player keep thinking that the four sub-bosses were the only real threats, and then reveal all of this Mother Miranda stuff at the end along with the fact that she exists. That aside, in this last major section of the game we find out that Chris was never the bad guy. Surprise, surprise. The Mia he shot was actually Mother Miranda. Her goal was to take Rose, but Chris figured this out and had to keep Ethan out of the loop because he might have ruined the operation, or he could have possibly been infected by Miranda at this point. Now you might be asking yourself if that was the case, why didn't he just say something after Mia was thought to be dead and Ethan was restrained? Well, then they couldn't have pulled this twist in the story, so deal with it. I know it's too late now, but we really should have told Ethan the plan. There wasn't time. We didn't expect Miranda to act so soon. Even so, you should have told him. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but this is exactly what I expected would happen and that's not necessarily a bad thing. One aspect about the ending I thought was really well handled though was the death of Ethan. This was a really cool moment and didn't feel forced or poorly thought out. In the process, we finally get an explanation for why he's able to have his appendages repeatedly turn to hamburger and not die. It seems like he essentially died at the Baker estate but was reanimated by the mold, which I know Capcom will want to say was the case the entire time, but genuinely I want to believe that there was never a story based explanation for why Ethan's hand was able to be reattached. Without a doubt in my mind, RE7 was meant as a fun spin off type of title that would shake things up. I doubt they ever had any intention of following it up directly and the hand being reattached with staples was just a dumb video game thing they never thought they'd have to explain. That being said, Ethan's death worked really well. It was a nice moment of self-sacrifice. One that I think was soured just a bit by the game doing everything it could to obscure his face still. Maybe I'm crazy, but I just don't understand this move. I mean, we already saw Ethan's face in Seven, so it's not like it was meant to be a secret. And on top of that, they're not billing him as a self-insert like they did in Seven. There's no expectation that I'll be able to put myself in Ethan's shoes now that he's an actual character with a real life story. So keeping his face a secret despite it not needing to be one, and the fact that it's a secret Capcom themselves already ruined, just seems like a really weird move to me. On top of that, this was his last scene in the series. You couldn't dramatically reveal his face for the last few moments he was alive. That just screams cinematic goodness. I have no idea what they were thinking here. And speaking of odd, just before this scene, in a section where we get to control Chris, there's a little mention of the BSAA being present, and then in the ending, we have this dangling plot thread where the organization is using BOWs to do their work now. There's not much that can be said about this since it was at the end of the game, and we'll have to wait a long time to see what it leads to, but I'm not necessarily against the idea of late game sequel bait. In a cinematic sequence, at the very end we get to see Rose all grown up and working for what I assume is Umbrella, and this to me set up what could be a really cool story for the future. 
Now, I'm not exactly sure how they could set up a game around a character who was torn into four separate pieces as a baby but still survived, but her character seems cool and you just can't deny the appeal of a bioweapon with tactical training taking out other bioweapons. In my opinion, much like in 7, this last section of the game that ties into the overall RE story was my favorite to play through. I don't necessarily have an issue with the nearly self-contained nature of three quarters of both 7 and 8, but when I play an RE game, the goal is typically to further flesh out that narrative world, and the last few minutes of 8 did that wonderfully for me. Having said that, maybe it's time we let the rest of the audience back in for a little bit of a summary. That boulder punching asshole! Let your first! So the story of Resident Evil 8 was at least as fun and as satisfying as its predecessor and that's mostly because it repeats nearly every single element from it. I had a bit of an issue with the way the story was revealed since they essentially withhold every single element that might explain your circumstances till the last few minutes of gameplay, but it's not like you're left with nothing up to that point. Until the very end, a majority of the story you'll get will concern the interesting characters you find yourself surrounded by and even though that's not what I ideally would want, I'd say it works out pretty well here. It did a great job of keeping me interested, and the best part of backloading all your cool story content is that you get a really long ending that fills in a lot of blanks. On top of that, there's a bunch of endgame revelations that sets up brand new plot threads, meaning this game asks more questions than it answers, and as a fan of Silent Hill, I can't exactly complain about that. If you're looking to play RE8 or you're in the middle of a playthrough right now, I'd say prepare to go long periods of time not knowing what the hell is going on, but trust that those dark spots will at some point be illuminated for you. Well, some of them. As far as I go, this was a really fun story. I enjoyed the eventual ties to the last game and little connections to the wider RE world. I could potentially understand someone wanting a more traditional method of delivery for their story, but the segmented nature of 8 that sees the game switching between focusing on side characters and then the actual plot felt pretty good to me. Not only was I really interested in those side characters anyways, but I also got a kick out of the effectively emotional ending sequence they all led up to. This may not be my favorite tale ever told in the overall Resident Evil canon, but it shows a clear amount of effort to blend the old with the new, and me being an old curmudgeon myself, I can most certainly appreciate that. <sighs> ah, shit! Okay, so I've got a butt ton to talk about where the gameplay is concerned, and I do want to get straight into the interesting stuff, but first I have to lay out exactly how this game works before I start with the analyzing. Resident Evil 8 is a game of multiple overlapping mechanics. On one layer you have the experience you might be expecting if you're coming straight from RE7. There's an element of exploration taking place in a few small sectioned off areas and this comes with all the trimmings you would expect. Puzzle solving, backtracking, slow paced tense combat, the works. And it's always nice to see what are essentially antiquated game design concepts put to use in a series that may have well have pioneered their existence in the mainstream. And I guess since we're moving down the list like this, why not just cover each overlapping mechanic as we get to it? So I guess we could call this section the Resident Evil part of the game, and I think you need to grade it in two different ways. First, you need to take a look at how well this part of the game works in a vacuum, and then how well it works compared to the other titles in the series. On its own, I found the exploration, item hunting, puzzle solving, and tight corridor driven combat to be pretty satisfying. The interior locations you're tasked with navigating aren't all that large until the very last section of the game, which means when backtracking is required, it's never over a great distance, which might be a plus for people used to the gameplay found in later RE games. There are four locations in the game where you'll get to engage in these traditional RE mechanics, so why don't we go through all of them and see what they have to offer. First up is Lady Dimitres Castle, and in my opinion, this is the location where this type of gameplay is best put to use. Like any self-respecting RE title, you start off with a very limited amount of rooms open to you and through some digging and puzzle solving, you'll collect keys and key items that'll further unlock more parts of the castle to explore. When you first start, certain parts of the castle remain enemy free, leading you to feel a little more relaxed when you're in them, but as you progress, more and more of the castle becomes inhabited by some kind of threat. The item collection and puzzles here feel pretty damn good, and unlocking more rooms to scrounge through feels expectedly rewarding. That being said, the difficulty of engaging in these aspects of the game do seem to be geared towards more casual players. Puzzles can be almost too simple to figure out, with most of them totally clearable using good old blind guessing. 
After I finally finished the game, I started watching reviews and analysis videos here on YouTube and I was pretty surprised to hear content creators like Narrow saying these puzzles were too difficult or obtuse for them to figure out on their own. To be fair to these content creators and to any of you who've already played the game, there's definitely a chance that these puzzles just skew towards tasks I'm more naturally good at, but in my experience, they are incredibly tame as far as challenge goes. The castle itself is an amazing location to explore with its early European architecture and creepy-ass environments. Without a doubt, they were channeling the old games here, and it definitely shows. There's a great attention to detail here, and the addition of eventually having Lady D stalk you around the house was masterfully executed. She works very similarly to Mr. X in RE2 Remake, but doesn't have the nasty tendency to just teleport to your location, and she's locked out of rooms where you'll need to spend a lot of time solving a puzzle. So I guess what I'm trying to say is she is a massive improvement over Mr. X. After Lady Dimitrescu is properly taken care of, we move on to Donna Benviento's house and this section switches things up considerably. Early on in the process of exploration, you have all of your items and weapons taken away from you and this part of the game essentially turns into Lucas's puzzle room from Seven. I found the puzzle solving and atmosphere in this area to probably be the best in the entire game. Not having any weapons made me feel vulnerable as hell and containing the admittedly tough puzzle to only two or three rooms meant that I wasn't at a huge time loss when I hit a hurdle in the process. After feeling pretty proud of myself for finally getting past this head scratcher, I encountered this fucking walking nightmare. The way it skulks out of the shadows here is just creepy perfection and the noise it makes while you're hiding from it will haunt your dreams. After this, we have yet another boss fight, but to be honest, I laughed at how easy it was. Donna is doing something to your head which blurs your vision and gives you hallucinations, and the goal is to find her doll hidden amongst all the other dolls in the room. But for both of my playthroughs on normal and hardcore difficulty, she was always right out in the open, and if that's not enough, you get an audio cue when you're near her. Without a doubt, this is the easiest boss encounter in the game, and possibly any other game for that matter. Next up is Moreau's area, and this section almost felt like a portion of Metro Exodus with how you approach it, or at least it did for me. It's mostly outdoor exploration of the reservoir and avoiding Moreau's giant fish form. I'd say this section is okay, I mean it's not bad, but I could take it or leave it. The boss fight that bookends it though is super fun. Definitely not the hardest thing in the world, but running to find cover when he did his acid rain attack was pretty cool and overall it was a really fun fight. After that, it's off to Heisenberg's factory, and this felt like a more substantial location as far as the amount of time spent in it goes, but sadly I didn't find this part of the game to be as engaging as Dimitres' castle. It's more about collecting items and backtracking than it is about puzzle solving, but I found the vertical layout of the place to be a pain for some reason. Combat in this section is fun and was probably the most technically challenging so far since enemies only take damage from their weak points and there's a pretty good variety of enemy types. So just as you get used to aiming at their chest just before an attack, they show up in a mech suit with rocket boosters or something. The last major part of the game, or at least the last portion I'm going to talk about, serves as both a location and a mechanic, and that's the titular village. This place stands as a kind of hub area, which actually plays into a more RE design formula a lot better than I would have thought. It essentially works like this. You explore the village, which will have you coming across an item that will open up more of the village area, and in doing so, you'll make your way to a new interior location, like say Heisenberg's factory. In the process of moving through that interior area, you'll find a key or item that you can bring back to the village, which will help you repeat that process. This central village location is dotted with all kinds of secrets and the game does a great job of slowly rationing out solutions to those secrets throughout the game's runtime. When I first had the concept of this hub area explained to me, I immediately didn't like it. Something about having a hub-like access point just didn't jive with what I knew about RE, but I'm glad to say it plays really well with 8's other elements. So if you're a traditionalist like me and you specifically don't want to play Village because this seems so radically different, just know that it works out pretty okay and it's actually really fun. Alright, so we've covered each individual location in the game and how they each slightly differ in their approach, so how do I feel about them as a whole? Well, altogether, I gotta say Resident Evil 8 really surprised me. I'll admit right up front that the obvious tilt towards recreating all of RE4's gameplay did leave a sour taste in my mouth during development. Call me a salty old man all you like, but quick time events and minecart rides will never spell the core Resident Evil experience for me. 
But as individual game mechanics, I'd say each element borrowed from RE4 is done so well that regardless of my own bias, they made for a really fun time. For example, leveling up my weapons using currency gain from exploration and combat was incredibly satisfying and made a very tangible difference when fighting. Continuing in that direction, no matter where you look in RE8, you're bound to have some kind of secret on screen, and for those like me that suffer from a very imaginary form of OCD, this would mean constantly wondering if I really got every item in a room, but RE8's map takes care of that little problem. I will admit that highlighting areas that haven't been picked clean yet can feel like a push in the direction of dumbing things down, but it also made for a less stressful experience, so maybe we'll call this one a wash. Well, I guess we'll call this section the new Resident Evil mechanics. So like it or not, Resident Evil is a first person shooter now, and with that comes certain expectations. I think if you were to rate RE8 against other FPS games, it would come up as pretty mediocre, but if you judge it as a tense horror game that just so happens to be in the first person, it plays just about how you'd want it to. You're going to be using guns for a majority of the time, and they feel great to fire, thankfully. There's a good amount of kick and visual feedback, which always makes the act of shooting in a game so much more fun. Sadly though, the sound effects used in the main weapons you'll be getting your hands on on a first playthrough are a little weak in my opinion. It seems like they were really trying to accentuate the highs and mids, and it leaves a lot of the guns sounding a little too tinny to me, like they're very lacking on the low end. Overall, I would say RE8 is a much easier game than 7. The puzzles don't exactly take too much brain power to solve, and thanks to slow enemies that aren't even the least bit concerned with attacking you and the ability to improve your arsenal, I didn't use my first healing item until about 3 hours in. Hell, I got through Dimitres' boss fight without her laying a single finger on me, leading me to check the options to make sure I hadn't put it on easy on accident. Now, normally this would be a complaint, but to be honest, there are a few things going on here that sort of negate a lack of difficulty. For example, you can mostly just stand in one spot firing and deal with a majority of the game's enemies, which isn't all that fun, but I found that I regularly got critical hits and head pops just as they approached for an attack. This made me feel like I was nailing these super purposeful last second kills when obviously that was not what was going on. And the same sort of goes for the puzzles. They were nowhere near as hard as something you might find in, say, an early Silent Hill game, but I still felt accomplished when I put two and two together relatively quickly without ever needing a guide. I assume these puzzles were workshopped to perfection with the goal of them never derailing forward momentum for any skill level player, and well it worked. Sure they aren't going to be stumping you for very long, but there's this middle ground that they tend to hit where the solutions always felt like they came from me and not so much from the game showing me exactly what to do, even when that wasn't necessarily the case. Getting back to the combat, one thing that really blew me away was the vast difference between the normal and hardcore difficulties. I got through RE8 with no problem, only dying a few times, and even then it was mostly from apathy and not so much a grueling spike in toughness. So I figured the next step up would be a much more healthy challenge for my next playthrough. So I tried out hardcore and the very first combat section of the game saw me dying an embarrassing amount of times. I was so frustrated that I had given up, only trying hardcore again on a stream later that night. Okay, so here we were just jumping right off of here, taking hits every which way. Good. Yeah, no, we're doing great. We're doing great. This is a fun... This is fun. This is good difficulty. This is how this is supposed to work. I was able to make my way through that first Lycan attack this time around, and I'll say that the game becomes so much more fair after that initial introduction to the combat. And if you ask me, minus the absolute terribleness that was my first impression, Hardcore should have been the default difficulty. Hits from enemies were punishing as all hell, and grabs resulted in an automatic drop to danger. My resources were being drained much more and it was a lot harder to maintain 100 plus rounds of ammo for my guns like I did in normal. Speaking of normal, the ease of the default difficulty was actually a huge bane for me starting a hardcore run. See, I had taken so little damage in normal mode that I never needed a block, so needless to say, I had no idea how it worked. When I eventually streamed my first successful hardcore run, my chat had to teach me the essentials live. And as I later learned, I had went the entire game thinking that blocks worked like they did in 7 with a small window of active frames. Turns out that's not the case and you can pretty much block for the entirety of the game. So if you're planning on tackling a higher difficulty, take my advice and get your blocks down first. Trust me, you're gonna need them. After beating the game, you're given access to a few different things. Most interesting to me is the extra content shop that lets you buy weapons that'll be available in the Duke's store. 
Some of these guns require not only having originally acquired the weapon in question on your last playthrough, but also other criteria like fully upgrading it. In my opinion, they should have added stat boosting items that sit in your inventory like those found in RE3 Remake's post-completion shop, but man, that's what updates are for, right? On top of this, you'll gain access to RE8's Mercenaries mode, and as some of you know, I've never really been huge on these modes in the past. So I booted up RE8's offering with the goal of getting a few minutes of footage just so I could talk about it here on the video, but I ended up getting sucked in. I found myself coming up with efficient strategies, learning the best guns to use, and how to best spend my money. I felt like some kind of speedrunning genius when I discovered that you could do much better by selling all of your shotgun and rifle ammo than using that money to buy the best handgun and upgrading it. Also, I found out that there is a pretty big window when activating power-ups that lets you quick turn so you can save microseconds while getting a buff. Needless to say, I am a huge fan of this mode and likely I'll still be playing it long after this video goes live. It may be a little bare bones and feel almost incomplete, but it was really fun for me. Okay, so I think we've laid out all the important parts of RE8's gameplay individually, so how do they all add up? Well, I'm going to need to answer that question in two ways. In a vacuum, Resident Evil 8 was incredibly fun and an absolute recommendation from me. Personally, I didn't find the European countryside location to be the most interesting or inherently scary place to set a game, but damn if I didn't enjoy myself there. The combat, while easy, was really fun and made me feel like I was pulling off way cooler moves than I actually was. Exploration and item fetching is always nice to see in a modern game and I was sucked into the weapon modification aspect of it. It seems like every inch of the map is covered in secret items and valuables and that made backtracking almost always rewarding. Hell, even now in my third playthrough, I'm finding all kinds of stuff that I missed before. So when you take it as a standalone title, it knocks it out of the park. Sure, there are things I would have liked to have seen added, but judging it on the content that's available on launch, I'd say you more than get your money's worth here. But sadly, that's not the only metric you should be judging RE8 by. The fact of the matter is, this is an entry in a long-running series, and we do have to hold it to the standards set by its predecessors as well, and on that front, I'd say things are slightly less positive. Don't get me wrong, it is always nice seeing that old Resident Evil DNA in newer AAA titles, but... In my opinion, RE7 does all of these things so much better than 8 does. The Baker Estate was just so much more fun to slowly open up and the puzzles in that game actually stumped me a few times. More than anything though, 7 actually had me scared most of the time. It seems to me that 8 really lost the plot as far as a horror game goes. Sure, Lady D's basement prison and that one part of Donna's house were really scary, but those were two small areas in a game made up of what seems like miles of territory. The focus in 8 was clearly not to horrify, and for any other game, that would not be an issue. I really don't think anyone is upset that the entire runtime of the first-person shooter Fear wasn't dedicated to trying to scare them, but this is a Resident Evil title. I expect for the game to at least be making an effort, and in my opinion, it was so wrapped up in selling me on the action, spectacle, and combat that it forgot it was also supposed to be scaring me. So if you're looking for creepiness and atmosphere in your first-person Resident Evil, 7 is going to be more of a win for you. That being said, if you're looking for fun, variety, and a lot of content, 8's going to be more your speed. It may not be the longest game in the series, but its 8 hours of runtime are stuffed with cool shit to do, and if you're anything like me, you will play through it multiple times. If the lack of enemy variety in 7 was a bother for you, trust me when I say 8 more than makes up for this. Every major area has its own enemy type to fight, and they aren't just palette swaps. You'll need to approach them differently, and this was very much appreciated on my end. Okay, so we've established that you sort of have to look at this game in two lights, but that doesn't exactly make for a good conclusion in a YouTube video. Resident Evil 8 is fun as hell. Like, seriously fun. Since my paycheck typically comes from looking at games like this, it's easy for me to get lost in minutia, focusing on how much a game has in common with old survival horror titles from the 90s instead of just having fun with them. And RE8 was something I could really enjoy for a change. It was exciting, tense, and had a story that kept me engaged in the small pockets where the gameplay wasn't. Without a doubt, I would assume the vast majority of you guys would have an absolute blast here, but just understand that it's going to be a very artificial kind of enjoyment. And what I mean by that is, every single inch of this game feels more like the result of market research than the product of a few people deciding to work on a project they truly love. Kind of like if you were to quantify each RE entry and feed it into some kind of predictive algorithm, this is what you'd be left with. Again, I really like this game and recommend it to anyone who enjoys the series or modern video games in general, but I just can't lose the feeling that it isn't so much of a game as much as it is some kind of growth that congealed in a focus group. Obviously, I would have preferred something far closer to RE1 than RE4, but that's just not the world we live in and I'm not going to judge a game by what it's not. 
So for a modern RE game looking to please just about every demographic imaginable, this is just about the best outcome anyone could have hoped for. An incredibly fun, if not slightly hollow experience. <laughs> I'm assuming I'm not going to blow anyone's mind by saying Capcom's RE engine can do some incredible stuff, and since its debut with RE7, it has wowed me with every subsequent entry. Well, I'm happy to say that trend is still going strong with Village, but there are some things that sort of perplexed me, or at the very least caught my interest. Before we get into that though, let me go ahead and say that this game is an absolute showstopper. I doubt very much that there is a more stylistically sexy game on the market right now and the research they did on European castles sure as hell paid off. Most of the game is spent looking at what seems to be the result of a fetishistic relationship with beautifully haunting vistas and I wouldn't have it any other way. Enemies in the game all look great close up, not that you're getting close enough to really appreciate that detail anyways, but it's great to know it's there. Weapon models are all top notch with the 1911 looking damn near photorealistic, although if they wanted that extra level of realism they would have had to jam every 30 shots or so. Once again lighting is one of the more impressive elements on display here, but that comes with a few caveats this time around. Back when I first covered RE2 Remake, I noticed that the game was dynamically shifting contrast and brightness to better fit where I was pointing my camera, which is a really cool system. The only problem being it wasn't doing it very fast. So if you know what you're looking for, you're definitely going to notice when the light levels suddenly fade or increase. After RE3 Remake was released, I was happy to see this little trick not present, but it seems like they decided to jam it back in for 8. Just like before, you'll probably notice brightness levels jumping and falling dynamically, and once again, it's not a huge deal at all, but just one of those things I couldn't stop seeing once I knew it existed. So I guess if you also fall into that camp, I apologize for ruining your next playthrough when you notice this stuff. Once again, the game has you setting up your default brightness and contrast levels at the start of the game, and once again, for the best results, make sure to keep your darks as dark as humanly possible and your brights as bright as you can. As far as faces are concerned, I was actually a little let down by this one. RE2 and 3 Remakes had these amazing looking mo-capped facial animations with all kinds of points of articulation. Well, here in 8, facial animations are nowhere near bad, but they look more hand animated to me. Not the worst look in the world for sure, but it definitely falls short of the incredibly impressive animations found in the remakes. To my knowledge, this is the first RE game to officially support ray tracing, and while it does produce some killer results, in my opinion it's just not worth the hit you're likely going to take to performance. I'm running a Ryzen 3900X and GTX 2080 Super in my machine and the game runs great at 1.2 times image scaling with everything nearly maxed out. The only exception being dynamic lighting which I did have to drop down to the medium setting to make sure I had a more consistent frame rate. For almost the entire game I was able to lock in a firm 100 frames per second but turning on ray tracing features dropped me down at least 20 to 30 FPS depending on the scene. Even when I lowered everything else, I wasn't quite able to hit my monitor's refresh rate with that stuff on, which really sucked. To be totally honest, the results you'll get with RTX are definitely great, but you can get a nearly similar look just by cranking the normal options, and you'll be taking far less of a performance hit for it. Maybe the new 3000 cards are handling RTX much better, but I guess we'll need to wait till I can afford my own personal island before I can confirm that. One thing that was incredibly interesting to me was how different Capcom's approach was to this game visually speaking. RE7 had a very found footage sort of aesthetic to its visuals with a heavy reliance on post-processing effects like digital noise, chromatic aberrations, light coronas, and a great little vignette applied to the whole screen. It also seemed to have a much softer picture which helped mask some imperfections and in my opinion this kind of look will definitely age much better than 8 will. Now these aren't effects necessary for a good look per se, but they did serve as a bit of a cover up when textures weren't quite up to snuff and overall gave the game a more grounded and realistic look. Oh and by the way, this game certainly has its fair share of low res sloppy textures as well, so that wasn't just a 7 thing. 8 seems to have ditched this stylized theming idea and in the process it receives a much more saturated color palette. Again, I'm not saying one look is better than the other, but each one does seem to reflect the general attitude the devs had in approaching these games. I will say I personally found the less saturated VHS tape kind of look that 7 had to better suit an RE game, but you really can't argue with how great 8 can look sometimes. There were plenty of times during my first playthrough where I just had to stop and admire how beautiful the scenery was. It has this almost dreamlike feeling to its picture and that somehow played nice with the more realistic looking surroundings you find yourself in like the disheveled village streets. Overall RE8 is an amazing looking game which honestly makes writing this section a little boring, I mean 
I can only praise this game so much. Now, if only there were some kind of single issue that plagued the experience I could talk about. You know, one that only I would ever have a problem with. Okay, so listen, I have this thing. If possible, I like to ditch the HUD and on-screen aiming reticle when I can in a first-person game. I like to have a more minimalistic, unobstructed view of things. Plus, it's nice when making a YouTube video if a majority of your footage doesn't have this big white cross in the middle of the picture. In the last game, there was an option for only displaying the aiming reticle when you're actually using your weapon, but Capcom seems to have thought this wasn't necessary this time around, so I kinda had to find a workaround. The only thing that seemed to reliably get rid of this unsightly thing was either a cutscene or the inventory screen. So you might have noticed already, but I was going in and out of my inventory constantly to get rid of the on-screen reticle. It would have been so easy for them to have programmed this kind of a feature in, and it's already present in the last game, so I have to assume this was another decision that shows how they approached this project. On the plus side though, 8 did one thing that could definitely be seen as improving over its predecessor. In RE7, I got really annoyed at the on-screen indicators, specifically how you could be 20 feet away from an item or interactable piece of the environment and still see an indicator for it. The only way to solve this issue for me was to turn off the in-game HUD, but that meant possibly missing hidden items. In 8, these indicators only show up when you're right on top of them though, so no more issues with standing in one spot of a room and seeing seven little triangles in your field of view. And speaking of that, let's talk about what you could call the one and only objectively bad decision made with this game. If you haven't noticed already, RE8 has an abysmally narrow FOV. Now this might be just a visual thing, but I found I had nearly no peripheral awareness because of this and I took a lot of hits trying to get past an enemy thinking I had plenty of room between him and I. Luckily, there is most definitely a fix for this on the PC, multiple fixes actually, and I just went with the first one that showed up on a Google search. The lazy FOV and vignette fix can either work as a trainer that needs to be running with the game or as a hard mod and both do exactly what you would think. So I gave it a shot and bumped my FOV up to 110 degrees and it was amazing compared to the default which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 80. Whether you're starting a new game soon or you're in the middle of one, I'd say this is a damn near necessary fix to apply. One that shouldn't be quite so essential seeing as how RE7 had no issues including an FOV slider in their game options. It may have only gone to 90 degrees, but it was something. Okay, so besides one or two flaws, this is an amazing looking game. It may have puzzled me why they would leave so much of the work they did on the previous game on the cutting room floor for this release, but you really can't argue with the results. Resident Evil 8 looks exactly like what it is, and I would say there might be a bit of negativity in that statement. This is a safe by the numbers AAA release and there's nothing wrong with that, but I couldn't help but feel like 7's more experimental look would have been great to see in an upgraded form here. It seems to me that Capcom did absolutely everything in their power to ensure this game was a hit and sadly that means axing graphical features from the last game that really helped it stand out from the average industry release at the time. I don't want this to sound like a criticism of the game itself specifically. As a singular package, this is an incredible looking game with some great artistic touches, but it just would have been nice to see Capcom continue pushing the boundaries of RE Engine with the continuation of their experimental and stylized approach to 7. As it stands, 8 fits right in there with the current high-end standard and there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but damn it would be nice to see them actually strive for uniqueness and not acceptance. Let's hope for the next release we get to see a little bit of both sides of that spectrum represented. Okay, so no more getting lost in nonsense. How did I feel about Resident Evil 8 compared to its forefathers and by itself? Well, as a video game, RE8 is fun, engaging, and jam-packed full of entertaining content. It has an awesome little story that kept me hanging on for every little piece it was willing to dole out, and the in-game content had me restarting it twice so far. As an entry in the current gaming market, I'd say it sits near the top. Probably one of the best times I've had with a modern release since remakes 2 and 3. As an RE game though, sadly I'd say it's lacking. It clearly wanted to mimic RE4 in every way imaginable, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that, except the fact that RE4 is a poster child for the phrase, good game, bad Resident Evil title, and in doing so it sort of relegated itself to the same fate. If you're looking for an engaging horror title that puts the scares far above the combat in its list of priorities, I'd say you'd have a much more fulfilling time with RE7, or any other Resident Evil title for that matter. But if you want a bunch of features commonly found in modern mainstream game releases, 
re 8s gonna have a lot more of what you're looking for. Now that may have sounded like some kind of an insult, but realistically, I don't expect Capcom to risk the millions and millions of dollars they spent on developing this title for the possible gain of pleasing the small sector of the industry made up of nerds like me. That being said, I feel like they were able to marry the two warring halves of their fan base with the last numbered entry, so it's a little disappointing to see them go full AAA with this one. A lot like you'll see with other franchises that went too far to please every possible demographic imaginable, Resident Evil seems to be slowly heading towards a future where all of its rough edges are sanded down to what we're left with is an inoffensive, smooth gray blob of a game. A game that in the service of catering to everyone will have only alienated its once core audience. Sure, it'll be mechanically proficient and well made, but I'm worried it will have also lost its character and uniqueness along the way. Now, it's important to point out that everything I'm saying hasn't come to pass. Yet. <laughs> RE8 still has a little bit of that punk rock attitude. There are still aspects of the game that seems geared towards RE fans, but if we're using the jump from 7 to 8 as a baseline, exactly how long till we have till that's not the case anymore? Here, let's put it like this. We may not be looking at the watering down of the RE franchise just yet, but I would argue you can at least get a glimpse of it from here. In closing, this was an incredible play, one that gave me just about everything I could possibly want from an RE game with the slight exception of those pesky elements that make an RE title what it is. Sure, backtracking, puzzle solving, and atmosphere are present in 8, but only just barely, and the cynic in me just can't help but feel like we may be seeing what is the start of a short road to another RE6, a game that isn't so much of a game, but an example of the entire game industry in a singular experience. Realistically though, I can't exactly make any hard predictions. Capcom has been known to go in whatever direction the wind is blowing, and releases like RE7 and 2 Remake do give me hope that there are still people working there who are interested in making Resident Evil games again. It's just hard to see everything that happened here and not get the feeling that it's the start of a journey whose endpoint we've seen in countless other franchises, including this one. So if I were you, I would absolutely grab RE8 with full confidence that you're going to have a fun, satisfying, and action-packed time, but maybe keep what I've said here in the back of your head and see if you find yourself disagreeing with all my doom and gloom. Truth be told, I hope I end up being proven completely wrong and laughed at for this take. After all, if the series doesn't go down the placating every audience path any more than it already has, we all win. So let's call this a confident thumbs up from a guy who might be a little uneasy about where things could go from here. And with that, I hope you guys enjoyed this little analysis. I know I didn't exactly bring this video to market along with the rest of the other reviewers, but late or not, I hope it touched on something that maybe some of them might have missed. I'd love for the future to end up proving me a worry wart, but until we figure that out, I hope to see all of you guys again right here on the Resident Evil Retrospective. <laughs>Hello fellow nerds and or dorks, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. If you liked what you saw here enough to want to support more of it, I've got a Patreon and t-shirt you might want to check out. Those of you who support me with services like Patreon and the YouTube membership program allow me to make the kind of content I want to make and not the stuff YouTube's algorithm wants me to. So if you do enjoy the odd thoughts that end up as projects here on the channel, a little bit of help would absolutely be appreciated. For anyone else, I hope you got into what you saw here enough to leave a like or click that subscribe button, but if not, I appreciate you just sitting down and listening to me ramble. Well guys, I hope you all stay safe and I will see you next time.